I'm not sure, um, actually, looking at Don and Stephen, if I, I know of um, too many other figures in rock and roll apart from uh, Leonard Cohen and Nick Cave who look as good in suits in rock and roll. I knew they'd make me look scungy when I came today, but those are the breaks. Um, I think, like um, many of me, you would have first encountered Stephen Cummings as the lead singer of the sports um, and those sort of hunched shoulders and alarm clock arms of his moving away to songs like Who Listens to the Radio. It's a really vivid part of my growing up process and a whole kind of shift in my way of thinking about music too. Um, it probably seems a long way from, from then and from when the sports won Best New Band at the Countdown Awards in 1978. Uh, 30 years on, 20 solo albums uh, by Stephen and a couple of really fine and surprisingly underrated novels, I think, that I'd urge you to check out as well. Um, and now we've got his uh, Take No Prisoners and Tell It Like It Is and Was memoir, Will It Be Funny Tomorrow, Billy, a title that, uh, up here. A title that kind of mystified me for a while till I realised it was about an encounter with Billy Joel that uh, Stephen can enlighten you about later, perhaps. Um, I think Stephen's always brought a really strong and mature sensibility to pop music, especially in albums like Love Town and New Kind of Blue and Falling Swinger. Um, Falling Swinger was actually nominated as one of the essential Australian, 100 Australian albums. And, uh, and yet, for me too, I always sense he's kind of operated in some kind of undercurrent way and he's been as, as much an observer as a participant on the Australian scene. Don Walker, I'm sure, is... Uh, all familiar to you as well, um, especially through his work with Cole Chisel. Um, you don't write songs like K San and Cheap Wine and Star Hotel and Flame Trees and Choir Girl and get forgotten too quickly. I mean, he's really a part of the cultural landscape and, and our whole kind of growing up and sense of being. Um, I think Paul Kelly's about the other, only other songwriter I can think of who comes close to, to matching him, and Paul Kelly writes a hell of a lot of songs. Um, but it's not just that Don talks about uh, the Australian environment, it's also the way Don writes songs, the kind of vernacular, uh, the way he sort of speaks uh, that comes out through the lyrics, and that's a, a really strong feature of his new book, Shots. Again, I'll hold it up. I'm doing a good salesman's job, I hope. Um, since Cold Chisel, Don's had a, a really sort of potent sort of career in groups like Tex Don and Charlie uh, and also with his own outfit, Catfish, and then Solo under his own name. Um, now he's uh, produced shots. Um, uh, I guess where Stephen's book is a, a tell-all, Don's book is a suggest-all. Um, it's composed of um, vignettes and little word pictures, sort of snapshot-type images uh, that could be a moment or a like a gunshot or a blast from a shot glass, depending on where your head's at. Great title, I think. But lots of stream of consciousness, impressionistic little poetic moments and a pretty powerful elemental sense of, of his country upbringing and his journey from that into the city and being seduced by rock and roll and everything that comes with it. Um, so if you're expecting it to be a, a cold chisel biography, you might be disappointed. It's more like leafing through a sort of series of dreams in the back of Don's head and um, finding out more and less at the same time and being intrigued along the way. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there and, and let both of them speak to themselves. Um, uh, Stephen uh, Cummings is going to speak first uh, and then Don Walker will follow him. Uh, thank you. Uh, I like a lectern. Minds me my school days, but uh, yes, it all you know it all seems like a good idea at the uh, time to uh, write a memoir or something. You know, it seems good, seems a uh, good thing to do. Do you do it? And then uh, you have to follow through and uh, stand in front of people. But you know, uh, it's been a uh, it's been a hell of a week in my life, I can honestly say. I could, I'd look, would you like a, I can tell a funny story. Uh, I can tell you the week in my life. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll try and tell both. Okay, this morning, this is... I, uh, I wake really early. I get up really early, like about 5.30. And uh, I used to do that because I smoked cigarettes and I would get up and have, like, 
two hours free to smoke cigarettes in the back of the house and drink coffee and read all the papers and stuff. But I haven't smoked. I gave up smoking three years ago. So. I don't do that now, but I've got into the habit of just getting up early. And I was up here in Sydney uh, last night, staying at this lavish hotel down the road. And I went for a walk early in the morning, and I was going for a walk around, thinking how much the rocks has changed. And, uh, you know, I was walking around under the bridge, and I saw... uh, a vision, there was a figure all dressed in black and a really expensive black suit and he was wading in the water and he had, well actually his rug wasn't that expensive but and he had on his hands like Robert Mitchum, didn't have love or hate, it had Dark Lord and Oh my God, it was fucking Nick Cave. He was in Sydney. He, undercover, he'd come to the Riders Festival because he likes Mark's work. And uh, he was uh, looking for uh, converts, obviously. He was uh, not knowing that my whole family has no religion at all. And he was waiting in the waters round there. Well, there used to be a great gig round there, the Harborside Brasserie, I think. But now it's a hotel. <laughs> and anyway, Nick was waiting in the waters. He wasn't feeding the 5,000, but he was waiting in the waters. And he said, Stephen. I said, oh, my God, Nick, what are you doing here in Sydney? And he said, Stephen, would you like to find Jesus? And I said, well, it's like 5.30, quarter to 6, you know. Fran's not on Radio uh, National yet. Sure, I'll, I'm, I'm in for it. So I got down. And we're both, me and Nick Cave, in the water. And before I know it, that he's skinny, but he's quite strong. He's got me and he pushes me under the water. And uh, he said, have you found Jesus yet, Stephen? And finally I splutter up and I say, no, Nick, I haven't found Jesus. I haven't found Jesus. And before I can say anything, he pushes me down again. And he's got those really expensive Italian shoes, which he gets made in um, Brazil from uh, angels' asses have little tassels on them and he sticks and he's got me under the water again and he said Stephen did you find Jesus yet he was speaking in an Irish accent I think being uh, hanging around with um, uh, what's that guy from the Pogues (laughs) Shane McGowan he'd been hanging around with Shane McGowan a lot and then finally he grabs me again, he stands down, he's stomping, he's doing, a, he's doing a dance on top of me and he's tweaking his moustache and he said, do you find Jesus, Stephen, do you find Jesus? And I finally managed to push him off because, you know, he is a private school boy and he's not that tough. I push him off and I say, Nick, that's enough, enough is enough. <sighs> I didn't find Jesus, but just fucking tell me, where did he fall in? (laughs) Sydney is a crazy city. It's very sophisticated. Things like that happen all the time. You know, and that's uh, the spirit of my book. Uh, uh, (laughs) Well, well, something, something even more strange happened on the way here. I caught a cab, I caught a cab here and, uh, you know, last night, caught a cab here, it was dark, it was dark, we were going through Alexandra, Alexandria, that's what I think it is, yeah, it used to be like all like, uh, when uh, years ago I remember it used to be all like factories and screen printers and metal yards and now it's like a, a high tech village and uh, I was going along there in the cab and I suddenly flipped out because I was going to have to talk here today. And I, uh, I uh, said to the taxi driver, I said, oh, my God, I'm flipping out. I think I'm a moth. And I thought, 
how many LSD trips do you have to take before it really like kicks in permanently? Uh, yeah. Anyway, I said, I'm a moth. I feel like I'm a moth. Quick, get me to a psychiatrist. Get me to a psychiatrist. And the taxi driver said, I don't know. Where are we going to get a psychiatrist at this time of night? And I said, go over there, go over there, go over there. And it was a sort of modern high-tech industrial village. And I went over there. And I rushed in. And I said, I'm a moth, I'm a moth, I'm a moth. And they said, can't you tell where uh, high-tech nerds we're playing some game i said i know i know but i saw the light on and i just had to come in well it's not a bad joke i uh, try and get all my jokes really off uh, 11 year olds on the train when i'm catching the train and as for this suit my friend uh i've resorted to uh, the days of my youth and I op shop again, and this was, uh, actually I saw Ash Wednesday, who was a me- an original member of the models, in uh, Bentley, a, uh, not a salubrious suburb, but not a bad suburb. It, just, a, you know, an average shit suburb. And uh, I said, uh, he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going op shopping, Ash. And he said, there's three really good black suits up at that shop up there. And I went there, and this is it. It's just $5. Three $5 seats. It's New Zealand wool. Beautiful. I'm up, you know, as you get up. In, what's that, uh, what was that famous poet? I know, you'll all know him. I th- uh, T.S. Eliot, Mark. You know that, wouldn't you? Quite a good You know of- that, being an educated chap. Uh, being a rock journalist. You, oh, you guys know everything. <laughs> you know, in my, in my end is my beginning. Uh, you know, uh, op shopping has become a hobby for me again. Anyway, basically with a book, you know, it's just me banging on about this or that. I started off doing it really just because um, I was sick of uh, reading all this... Uh, uh, biographies where people don't, uh, um, you know, they, uh, when I was a kid, you'd like joined a group because you did bad things and interesting stuff would happen, you know, but uh, most of the rock biographies you read, uh, nothing sort of very interesting or strange ever happens. Or, you know, stupid, you don't do dumb things like go and play up in Perth from uh, at a disco from uh, midnight to 6 a.m. and get paid $40 a week. <laughs> you know? You don't do dumb stuff like that. If it wasn't for uh, the guys from the Last Chance Cafe, we would have died <laughs> because they were good guys. But, uh, and also, I just wanted to get the thing across, which I think is kind of... Um, really overlooked in Australian society is, is like in about 1973 and 1974 and those sort of times, I think they were very interesting times uh, because you could basically do anything. I mean, I consider myself to be a lucky stiff because I uh, started playing music at a time when you could... Um, write a song that day and people will go out to a hotel to see, to see and hear that song that you wrote that day. People sort of like that. Now people only go out to see uh, shows where they know exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> what a weird world. Anyway, so there was that sort of thing I wanted to do too because I think, you know, there's a whole lot of crap now where you got, you know, all your probably powerhouse curators and all that sort of crap. Um, go and uh, it's become an orthodoxy that, you know, punk was very interesting and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, yeah, the birthday party were great and Black Fag were great and all this crap. And it's just, you know... Bullshit, and it's basically uh, it's. Uh, what was I? Where am I? I lost my thought just in saying that because I saw them laugh. <laughs> Those girls laugh. <laughs> I um, the thing was, it uh, really punk. It got sort of like 
integrated so quickly by mainstream capitalism that really what it did was it enabled things to be classified much easier. So instead, when you went to the record shops, then they could say, this is a something record, this is a new wave record, this is a roots record, this is a thing. It just made it easier for record companies, you know, to flog shit to people. <laughs> Some of it was good shit. But you know what I mean? It's sort of like, I sort of think that sort of, you know, unless people sort of uh, mention stuff like that. I mean, when I was in Melbourne young, you know, our first gigs, we, we went out when the Plucker Brothers and we played, uh, our first two weeks were playing at uh, factories. You know, two workers, uh, it was in the early Whitlam years, and we went up and played at Steelworks, as if those poor guys hadn't suffered enough now to have us playing country music to them and stuff like that. Well, you know, or Pentridge or stuff like that. It was an, in, it was an interesting time. I think sort of both of us, uh, were, you know, were in groups at the time when it was an interesting time to be in groups when it was... Uh, uh, more you could just like do something, uh, you know, off the top of your head and you didn't expect, I never expected anything. When I was 12, I used to wag school and go to lunchtime discos uh, in the city and see the Purple Hearts and uh, the Wild Cherries and things like that. And had discos, it cost two bob to get in and uh, you would... Uh, it will be full of girls from business college. I don't think they have business colleges anymore. Or they'd have, uh, you know, they'd, uh, you'd do a, uh, some other degree at uni or something about it or uh, university of, I think the, U, the University of Technology would have a course for sure. What because do you think? think? Do you work they, there? I work there and oh, I think good. they could. Good. My partner got a degree there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, uh, well, look, yes. So, look, it's me banging on. I talk about stuff like uh, that. I talk about modern music. I talk about, you know, girl groups, uh, about this wa- new wave of uh, sort of feminine albums. Uh, I talk about... What else do I talk about? Oh, I'm a mother and father. I've had a hell of a week. My mother died last week. I uh, spent... Five days with her in hospital, laying next to her, and it uh, was um, very bemusing because my mother only ever came and saw me play music once in her whole life and never read either of my books. But in the hospital, I took a nylon string guitar and she couldn't get enough of it and she got me playing over my, my fingers are just like so. So fucking hard, and uh, she finally liked it. So it was, uh, (laughs) you know, and my sister, who never showed any fucking interest in my whole life, (laughs) apologised to me as well. It was just, you know, it was too much for me. I said, I can't deal with this now. We'll have to talk about this in about five years. Let's meet, let's meet up in five years for coffee, darling. And, uh, yeah, that's what the book's about. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, next up to the microphone uh, is uh, Don Walker. Good afternoon. Um, I'm a musician and a songwriter. I'm on a 12-point plan. No, that's not right. (laughs) Um, The reason I'm here at uh, at a writer's festival is that uh, quite late in life I've written a book. Uh, Steve's written a few in his life, but this is my first one. It's called Shots. Um... I've known these guys for a long time. Uh, Mark has been a a journalist specialising in music for quite a few decades now. 
and inevitably there's been a couple of times where in the course of his job he's interviewed me. Mark has a reputation of being the most cerebral of uh, music industry journalists, which means, and it's particularly true in my case, he, he's usually done a lot more thinking about his interview subjects music than the interview subject. <laughs> so there's, there's often times when Mark will ask me a question in interviews and <laughs> And I'll have to ask him to back up to the beginning of the sentence because I just don't know what he's asking me. Uh, Steve, in our youth, Steve and I uh, circled the same scenes in the late 70s and early 80s because we were both in early bands at the same time. And uh, somehow, without ever actually sitting in a room and having a yarn. So this is actually... <laughs> My, my first say hello and shake hands with Steve, who I feel like I've known for 30 years. Uh, I knew Martin Armager, the, uh, the guitar player in, in the band of Steve's youth. Uh, I know him quite well, but Steve and I never really crossed paths. Uh, despite the, um, the title of the team outside this room, uh, I don't consider that I've lived... Well, I know I haven't lived a rock and roll life. And uh, I haven't really written a rock and roll book. Uh, or really a memoir, for that matter. And if I, if I could describe to you what it is instead, it would have made the job a lot easier for me and the publishers. We finished up calling it a memoir by default. But it's a, it's a series of... of snapshots and impressions. I'm going to get right through this speech, incidentally, without mentioning Nick Cave. And <laughs> yes, while I think he's done some great work, he, I, I don't think about him every day. And <laughs> I don't know if that's because I'm not a, a rock journalist or if it's because I'm not from Melbourne. But, um, the, the book Shots is a... Is, um, there's a series of, of impressions that I wrote just filling a page over many years um, and uh, quite late in the piece uh, I thought I'd, I would have a try at coalescing them into a book. Uh, most of the effort involved was in trying to arrange existing writing in a way that, uh, that it flowed sequentially between a front cover and a back cover. Um, I, I still can't stand up here and say that I've written a book because the idea of, of sitting down and writing 60,000 words, I just think, is, is uh, you know, would freeze the human mind. I don't know how people do that. Uh, so I, I did it without looking. Uh, I'll read a short bit before I sit down. I thought I'd tell you a little story that... Uh, my recording engineer told me, a man called Phil Punch, who's a huge fan of anything recorded and any recording technology pre-1960. Phil Punch tells me that re tape recording technology was invented by the Nazis. And it was invented, the idea of recording voice to magnetic tape was invented by the Nazis so that Hitler could deliver speeches on radio in cities without actually being present in those cities. And until the end of the war, he in fact confused Allied intelligence considerably because all their on the ground intelligence was telling them that Hitler was in Bremen, but yet he was giving a high fidelity radio address from Hamburg, etc. They didn't discover how he was doing this until after the war in the, in somewhere in the smashed ruins of Germany an American GI came across one of their tape machines, a couple of their tape machines and uh, in the fine US Armed Forces tradition looted them straight back to New York where they were sold, um, as the story goes, uh, quite cheaply to a representative of Bing Crosby and Bing registered the patents. So from then on, 
if you want to know why Bing looks so relaxed, <laughs> it didn't matter that Frank Sinatra came along and said, you know, I've superseded you. Rock and roll, Elvis, all that didn't matter. Didn't matter what those guys did, right through the Beatles to punk, Bing was getting money out of it. <laughs> so I won't rabbit on any further. Um, it's my belief that rock and roll is, is a new thing. It's the first new thing that, come, that has come along really since maybe the invention of steel or the invention of religion or something like that. Rock and roll, I don't believe, is an art form. It's not, a, it's not another angle on politics. It's not a social movement. It's certainly not an environmental movement. <laughs> um, to my mind, rock and roll is diluted when it's mixed with any of these things. Rock and roll, is, in its essentials, is a, a pure force. It's a primary colour. I'll just read a short half page and then I'll sit down. 